starting uh, in verse 12 of chapter 11. We're going to read through 26. And before we start, you should know that this is, once again, the sandwich structure that Mark often uses. So he starts telling one story, comes in, tells another story, and then finishes the story that he started in the beginning. We're going to read about the tree and the temple. This is supposed to be together, taken as one big chunk. So starting in verse 11, a little context first, and then the slide will start at verse 12. But verse 11 is our context. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So, verse 15, they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. This is less than 24 hours later. Verse 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Heavenly Father, Thank you once again that we could sit in this comfortable building, Lord, and read the Word of God that has been passed down to us, printed in these Bibles, so convenient for us to read. Father, we don't take any of that for granted. And we sit here today, anxious to hear a word from you, open to your Spirit changing our lives. Lord, would that happen today as we draw our attention to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, so a little bit of background here. This is all taking place in Jerusalem, which, as you know, is it's the capital of Israel. So this is the ancient capital of Israel, which is known as the City of God, which is the holiest place in Jerusalem. And they're, they're not even just in the, the City of God in the holiest place. They're in the holiest of the holiest places, which is the Temple, which this would have been the heart of Israel's religious life and the symbol of Israel's national identity. And so Jesus goes there, as we saw in verse 11, he takes a look around, and then he leaves, and then he comes back, and he doesn't like what he finds going on in the temple. So then he goes back, and on the way, he sees this fig tree, and it's a strange story. He sees the fig tree that has leaves, and he goes up to it to see if he can find some fruit on it. It doesn't have any fruit, and so he curses it. Verse 14, let no one eat fruit from you ever again, and his disciples heard it. Now, isn't this strange? This is the only place in the Gospels that we see Jesus using his powers to destroy something that's not, you know, a demon. We see him doing exorcisms. We see him raising the dead, feeding people, healing people. But here, he snaps and he calls down a curse on a tree. Bizarre, right? Why would he do that? Is he overreacting? Is he being excessive? Was he hangry? No, he's teaching us a foundational lesson. And this is the lesson. That fruit matters. Fruit matters. This is a consistent theme all throughout Jesus' teachings. And I'm going to build this case here from a couple of scriptures from the Gospels. Luke chapter 13. Listen to this. This is verse 6 through 9 of Luke 13. Jesus speaking a parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found 
none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. So we see that in this parable Jesus is telling. It's important. Fruit matters. Fruit matters. Any of you struggling gardeners like myself out there? Yeah, actually, I have a lemon tree that I was frustrated with. I was going to cut it down, and then it finally produced some fruit. Listen to this. Matthew 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. John 15, 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. That verse is saying the proof that you're Jesus' disciple is the fruit. Later in that chapter, John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. And then one more example, Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 20. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. So we see this is a, something Jesus teaches about a lot. In fact, in, in the scriptures as a whole, we see this theme of fruit 106 times in the Old Testament, 70 times in the New Testament, which means this is a big deal. So what do we mean by fruit? Well, we mean outward manifestations of a transformation. That's what fruit is. And so today I want to talk about fruit a little bit, give you three clear signs of fruit, because fruit matters to God. The first clear sign, amongst many, but this is one of them, is an attitude of repentance. An attitude of repentance. Talking directly to you now, think about yourself. Are you genuinely repentant when you sin? Do you feel a burden? Do you feel a weight? Do you feel a conviction to confess when you sin? Do you desire to turn from your sin? Or when, when you sin, do you just revel in it and don't even think about repentance? That's not a good sign. That's not a good sign. When you do sin, can you not enjoy it for very long? These are repentant attitudes. This is fruit. Martin Luther, we just uh, watched a movie about him at the men's night. Didn't come, you missed out. But this is actually the, the 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. And Martin Luther, he's famous for nailing those 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. And the first one says this, When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, Matthew 4, 17, He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. You know what? I think he's right. I think he's right. If you can't remember the last time you told the Lord, I'm sorry, or you told another person that you've offended, I'm sorry, if you can't remember the last time you asked for forgiveness or read God's word and said, you know, I'm wrong. I was wrong. If you can't remember that, that's a good sign, folks. This is fruit. Repentance is fruit. Now, the next thing, a changed life. Another sign of fruit is a changed life. Famous verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, when you become a believer in Christ, God the Holy Spirit enters your life and he begins to give you a new heart, a new mission, and he begins to transform and change you. So, are you different than you were on the day when you first trusted Jesus? Are you different after Christ as you were B.C.? You should be, because there should be inevitable fruit. Now, this would look different in all of us. I think the danger is, is when people start to measure each other's fruit. Don't do that. It's individual inventory of your life. But are you, are you changed? Have you been messed up in a good way by God? Listen to this from Galatians 5.19. It talks about the fruit of the Spirit. First, it gives a list of things that would characterize somebody before Christ, behaviors and characteristics. Galatians 5.19 says this, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, 
heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then it brings a contrast here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. What's the last one? Self-control. Against such there is no law. So do a fruit inspection on yourself. Am Am I bearing fruit in this way? Am I more loving than I was before I knew Christ? Am I more joyful? Do I have more peace or am I filled with anxiety all the time? Am I more patient or do I have a short fuse? Am I more kind? Am I more faithful? Am I more gentle? Do I have more self-control? If you've gotten to the place where you're okay with your sin, you're numb to your sin, and there's no evidence of change in your life, that's not a good sign, folks. And you know what? I'm tired of more people not talking about that. We can't avoid this topic. Fruit matters. Fruit matters. And one other sign of fruit is this, a desire for the things of God. A desire for the things of God. So now you're, you're wanting what God wants because he wants it. You want what God wants. So you love your neighbor because God wants you to do that. And you want to please God. You obey him. You're in his word. Your marriage is thriving as you yield it to the Lord. You desire for those things. You desire to be generous. You desire to be a missionary where you live. If you could care less about those things, that's not a good sign. We should have fruit. We should have fruit, a desire for the things of God. So these verses that we just read about this fig tree, this is like an acted out parable of what's important to God. See, on the outside, they had this green leaves. It looked good, but he gets closer and there's no fruit. It promised fruit from a distance, but as Jesus got closer, disappointed. So why is he teaching this now? Why is Jesus teaching his disciples this lesson now? Well, as I explained earlier, he goes right into the temple and there's a parallel going on here. He's saying what's, what's true of this, of this fruit tree, this fig tree, is true about the temple and what's going on there. It looks beautiful on the outside, but inside it's fruitless and barren. He didn't like what he saw there. And so he's acting out this parable on this fig tree as a way of saying that God's judgment is going to fall on the, the unfruitful and specifically on Israel and what's going on in the temple here. So he continues, and then we're going to see in verse 15, read with me. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. I was thinking this morning how fun it would be to set up a table and just flip it over. But I was like, I don't want to distract and make a joke of it because it's not a joke. This is very serious, what's going on here. But just picture the violence of this. Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. He's saying, hey, stop this, stop this nonsense, right? You can't use the, the temple as a shortcut. And then verse 17, then he taught, saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? You guys made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. So what happened to this fig tree, the fruitlessness, Jesus sees that in the temple. In fact, in in Hosea chapter 9, the fig tree is used to represent Israel. So there's a direct connection here. Some of you might be thinking, wait, I I thought Jesus was sweet. I thought Jesus was meek. Why is he going around flipping tables? What's going on with that? Well, a little bit of context here. This is taking place in the outer courts of the temple, which is known as the court of the Gentiles. This was the place that if you were a God-fearing Gentile, this is as far as you could go to worship God, to sing to God, to honor God. And the high priest at that time, Caiaphas, knowing this, he still disrespectfully authorized a market to be set up in that court of the Gentiles, that outer court. So these Gentiles would come here to worship the true God of Israel, 
Instead, when they got there, there'd be chaos going around. First, there needed to be an exchange of money. So Roman money needed to be transferred into Jewish currency to give your, your offerings to the temple. Every male over 20 years old had to pay temple tax, and they had to use these silver coins from, from Tyre, so they had to exchange. So they set up convenient booths there, you know, to do that. It's kind of like you go to the fair or something, there's ATMs conveniently located at the entrance. So this is going on, all this money exchange. And then, secondly, animals need to be purchased for sacrifice. So you have to understand that people would travel from all over to come to the temple. There's pilgrims. This is during Passover time. Pilgrims are coming from far away. They're not going to bring their cattle, lambs, birds with them. They're going to purchase them there at the temple to sacrifice. And so these, this purchasing of animals is going on too. And the third thing you need to know is that this whole business was getting the temple and the religious leaders extremely rich. And they loved that. They cared less about the spiritual well-being of the, the people there especially the Gentiles, and they cared more about the weight of their wallet. And so it was a chaotic mess. It was irreverent. The historian Josephus, he called the the outer courts of the temple an oriental bazaar and a cattle mart. And he even wrote about how in one week, 255,000 lambs were sold. Picture this going on in there. I mean, picture yourself coming to church. You're trying to focus on God, worship Him, honor Him. And there's sheep bleeding, going to the restroom all over the place. It's a chaotic mess. And so Jesus intentionally comes back the following day after he did the first visit. He intentionally comes back and gets infuriated at this money-making zoo. And even in in the book of John, we, we read about him fashioning a whip and coming back. How angry do you have to be to make a whip? If Jesus is coming at you with a whip, too, you know you've been bad, right? What we see here is that Jesus is infuriated about what's happening at the temple. Now, he's not necessarily mad at the the trade itself. People did need to have animals for sacrifice, but that wasn't the place to do it. There needed to be a level of respect there. And then it talks about how he prevented people from carrying wares through the temple The ancient literature talks about people using the temple grounds as a shortcut to get from one side of town to the other. Imagine you live over here in this neighborhood. You want to go to that neighborhood and just just walk right through here during the middle of church. How disrespectful is that? And so Jesus quotes scripture to them. Verse 17, Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written? This question implies a yes in the original language. Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, a couple things I want to draw from this. First is this. God has a universal love for all nations. Oh, there's a picture of the court of Gentiles. Should have showed that, but you can kind of get a little picture uh, of what that would look like. All right, it's the outer side, and then as you go in, there's the court of the women, and then the inner court where the sacrifices would actually be made. But getting to this next point. God has a universal love for all nations. Jesus quotes scripture from Isaiah here, and he quotes scripture from Jeremiah here. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. You know, I think this is a very timely word for us right now, because if you get really into the news, it gets easy to to build up a bitterness and hatred towards people from other countries. And we don't see people as people. Instead, we we see what's going on in their government and assume the whole nation is like that, and we hate people. But we shouldn't do that because God has has a love for all nations. He doesn't just love Israel. He doesn't just love America. No, God loves Iran. He loves Afghanistan. He loves North Korea and the people in them. He desires for them to come and worship him. And we read in Revelation 7 that one day that will actually happen. People from every tribe tongue and nation will be around the throne worshiping. And so we see that God stands in authority over all nations and he desires for them to worship. So we should care about the nations. We should have a deep burden for all of the nations of the world. There's this mentality that I've, that I've heard that, eh, why do we send missionaries across the world? You know, we got plenty of lost people right here. Granted, that's true. 
We should be missionaries wherever we are. But God has also mandated us to have an impact on the entire world. So we shouldn't get salty about that. We should be excited when people go to other countries and share the good news. Because God loves all nations. Next thing in this passage. My house should be called a house of prayer. A house of prayer. So we see that God wants his people to pray. Elementary concept, right? Christianity 101, praying. But if we know it's true, why do we rarely pray? And notice that Jesus specifically used this prophetic text from Isaiah. He called attention to this. And Isaiah said it wasn't a house of preaching or music per se or skits or uh, concerts or plays or performances. It was a house of prayer. A house of prayer. Now we don't go to a temple anymore. If you read your New Testament, you realize the body of Christ is the temple, right? We are the temple. God, the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. So you have to keep that in mind. But if, if God's house back then, the temple, was considered a house of prayer, shouldn't we as people be considered prayerful people? That just makes sense to me. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you think you would be benefited from being prayed for. Anybody? Would you benefit from being prayed for? We should pray more, church. We have a prayer meeting on Monday morning down in the, the office. It starts at 9.30. You're all invited to join us. It's an amazing way to start the week if you're able to. I know some people work on Monday mornings. But if you can come, join us. And then after church, every, every week we have prayer counselors that are in the front. This isn't just for people to come if they are curious about salvation. This is for you to, to make use of. You know, I need prayer. I'm having a rough day. It's been a rough week. Maybe your marriage needs prayer for. Maybe you need to pray for your kids. Whatever it is, come and pray. We want this to be a house of prayer. So then let's continue the story. Uh, the scribes and the chief priests, they get mad. They want to kill Jesus, verse 18. Uh, they wanted to destroy him, but they couldn't do anything at that moment because everybody's awe, in awe of Jesus' teaching. And then when evening had come, Jesus went out of the city. And then the, in the morning, so this is less than 24 hours later, verse 20, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. This is the same tree that Jesus had cursed. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Astute observation, right? Verse 22, so Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And then verse 25 and 26, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Your trespasses. So they see this withered fig tree, and then Jesus uses this as an opportunity to, to teach him about prayer and about forgiveness and other things. And there's a verse in here that probably catches your attention. Verse 24, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. You're thinking, yes. This is like a genie in a bottle situation. Right? Anything I pray for, I can get? What about a new car? I could pray for a Ferrari and get one of those. Other scripture helps us to, to find out what exactly is being said here. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3 says, Yet you do not have because you do not ask. So it's a good thing to ask. But you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. God's saying, I'm not your genie in a bottle, okay? If you're just asking for stuff for your own pleasure, why do I have to give that to you? If it's for your selfish motives, for you, your prayers aren't going to succeed. And then 1 John 5.14 is a great one. to. I would even write that in the margin of your scripture next to this verse if you could. 1 John 5.14 says this, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. What's the key phrase there? According to his will. So there's conditions on effective prayer. First, it's, it's faith. It needs to be a prayer of faith that Jesus makes clear here in Mark 11. 
also needs to be according to God's will. Because he's not going to allow things to happen that aren't according to his will. And third, forgiveness is actually a piece of effective prayer too, which is fascinating. We see in verse 25 and 26 that Jesus talks about forgiveness. He says, if you stand praying, if you hold something against someone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Interestingly enough, verse 26 isn't in the oldest manuscripts that we have. There's just something worth pointing out. But it is in Matthew chapter 6. So that's in there too. I know it's a hard verse, but you can't get away from it by just saying, oh, that one verse isn't in the oldest manuscript. No, that's in Matthew 6. <laughs> so forgiveness is tied to our effectiveness in prayer. So if you're trusting him, if your heart's right with him, if you're praying for his will to be done, if you have forgiveness in your life, you can expect mighty things to be happening in your prayer life. So we need to be praying, church. We need to be praying for our kids. We need to be praying for our marriages in here, husbands, wives. I discovered a verse this week. Listen to this, 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands likewise. If you're a husband, raise your hand. Listen to this. Dwell with them, talking about your wives, dwell with your wives with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. The way you treat your wife at home is direct, directly related to the effectiveness of your prayer life. Hello? Wake up, man. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. All the ladies are like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We should be praying for our marriages. We should be praying for our nation like we always do. Be praying for our church. Pray for me, please. Pray for the leaders in the church. So today, as I want to start getting in the habit of doing more often, I'm going to spend a, a couple minutes in prayer just with the folks around you. Small groups, maybe spend five minutes, okay? You can share some quick requests. If you don't feel like socializing today, that's okay. You can just pray where you're at. And then we're going to close uh, with the song today. So why don't you just feel free to shuffle around a little bit. About five minutes, we're going to get in small groups and just pray because this is a house of prayer. All right, church.